I have two terrifying tales of terror for you this evening. Exclusively from Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so you could share your stories with me and I could read them all to you. Both loosely on the theme of confronting your childhood fears. First up, we have a cautionary tale of what not to do when you find strange things out in the woods. And this is followed by a Halloween prank that goes a little bit wrong. Well, my dear friends, a new week is upon us, and I think you all deserve to start it by sitting down and relaxing with your favorite drink, because it's time once again to listen. It's amazing how one day, more specifically, how one single moment can alter your fate forever. My moment took place when I was 10 years old, the summer before fifth grade. My parents both worked. I was a latchkey kid back in the days where it wasn't looked down on. I'd be alone in the mornings, and my parents would come home shortly into the afternoon, giving me just enough time to myself. On the outskirts of our backyard was a path that led out into the woods. I'd make myself breakfast, get my chores done, and head out on walks. I'd pretend I was a great adventurer. Every sound an unknown enemy. Every stick a different sword for battle. It was loads of fun, and it kept me from being in front of the television all day, so I figured my parents wouldn't mind. There was always a set distance that I made myself stick to. If the animal graveyard was in sight, I knew it was my time to turn back. Oof, my body breaks out in chills, thinking about it to this very day. From what I can remember, well, from what I can't ever forget, the animal church was this huge flat slab of concrete, big enough for me to lay down on, and then some. There were statues like I'd seen in older churches. There was a porcelain praying Mother Mary figurine, and a couple of others I didn't recognize. Three red candles sat on dishes about a foot apart from each other. Their wicks were long, but had signs of recent use. Behind them was a post where rosary beads hung from nails. There were jars with lids also, with what I now know was incense inside. Quite a few times I'd seen other people's beloved dead pets placed on top of it. I didn't understand why they didn't bury them under the ground. Maybe, well, that's just how it's done sometimes. Or maybe there were too many animals under there already, so well, people had to leave them up there. To my young mind, it just looked like a makeshift pet memorial. A sacred place. Yeah, it looked a little weird, and the location left a lot to be desired, but it was useful to me. It signified a barrier in the woods I knew to stay far away from. Besides giving me the creeps, it never really bothered me, and I made extra sure not to bother it. There was never anyone there, although I knew it had been used due to the changing candles and statues. It was a Tuesday morning, toward the end of June. I come out for my walk to find my beloved cat, Aero, dead in the front yard. He was given to me when he was barely old enough to be separated from his mother. The only cat I've ever seen running when you called him, oh, just like a dog. Well, looked like he'd gotten in a fight with another animal and died overnight. My heart was shattered. He was the best cat a kid could ask for. It wasn't fair for me to have been the one to have found him. I wasn't ready for that fact of life yet. I didn't quite understand death and everything that came with it. So, I did the only thing I could think to do. My feet heavily tromped through the house, footsteps angry with the unfairness of life. After a quick search of the house, the only candles I could find were birthday ones. Well, it'd have to be enough. Mum and Dad were coming home shortly. I liked to be in the house before then, so they wouldn't worry or come home to an empty house. Mum's gardening gloves were on our porch, so I grabbed them on my way out of the door. I picked up Arrow as respectfully as I could and held him in both arms as I went down the path. 
There it was. The animal church, as I'd named it years ago. But instead of turning back this time, I kept walking forward. There was a disgusting, sweet earthen smell that hurt my head. The triumvirate of candles all sat unlit. Like, like they were waiting for us. The remains of someone's poor beagle laid at my feet on top of the platform. Oh, I hated seeing this, and I needed to do something, anything, to make the situation better. So, I did what I normally do in situations where I was nervous. I prayed. I set Arrow down on the ground, lowered myself down on my knees, and put a hand on the beagle's paw. Dear Lord, thank you for this place, and thank you for all of the animals. Please take care of this one and have St. Francis give him milk bones every- uh! I stopped mid-sentence. I heard a sound coming from where my hand was, causing it to freeze in mid-air. The beagle's head shifted ever so slightly. I jumped up as fast as humanly possible and backed away. After a few minutes of no movement, I convinced myself it was a trick of the eyes. I was imagining things due to the stress and sadness of the situation. I sucked it up and again approached the animal, intending to finish the prayer. This time, though, I had my cat with me, ready for him to join the other animal's final resting place. Before my lips could utter a word, I was unsettled by a skittering sound. Just as I leant in for closer inspection, a millipede made an unwelcome entrance, crawling out through the putrid hole that once contained the dog's left eye. Succumbing to unnerving terror, I tossed Era onto the platform. My footing was lost along the way, and I fell forward. I was horrified to see that I landed on animal bones. In a hasty effort to get on my feet again, I knocked over one of the statues, breaking it into pieces. Oh, shit. My hands shook as I took a pack of stolen matches out of my pockets. Not knowing exactly how it all worked, I only lit one candle. I figured one candle for one cat. Porcelain pieces of the statue's broken corpse made a rattling sound as they shifted from a sudden cold wind. Assuming a storm must be coming, and more than ready to get out of there, I turned on my heel and ran. I ran until my sides screamed with cramps, and then pushed myself to run some more till I got home. I didn't look back, and I didn't stop. I'm 34 years old now. This experience was lost to memory for many years. I didn't really give it a second thought, other than it being a creepy event that happened to me as a kid. Honestly, there was never really any reason to think about it, until about six months ago. I started getting plagued with terrible nightmares, visions of warped, bleeding statues and demented dead animals, fur matted with gore, eyes angry, the ones that still had them, that is. I woke up, a Sunday morning this time, to 16 missed calls on my phone from my grandpa. When I went to dial his number, he was calling me again. His voice shaken with sobs. He told me I needed to come over right away and that something was very wrong with my grandma. An ambulance was already there by the time I arrived. I remember pausing and touching it before going into the house, knowing that my grandmother had already passed away inside of it. Discarded groceries were scattered across the counter the condensation of a forgotten milk gallon collected in a puddle underneath of it. Sometimes you remember the smallest things about the biggest tragedies. We followed the ambulance to the hospital and were informed on arrival that Grandma was gone. They weren't sure exactly what had happened, only knew that she couldn't be saved. Two months later, my mother went into cardiac arrest. It was over seven minutes before they were able to start her heart again, and by that time, her brain was too heavily damaged. One year after that summer I mentioned, 
My parents split up. My dad took off. I still to this day haven't seen him and, well, don't care to. My mum couldn't handle it, and we moved in with my grandparents. She met someone else, and it was decided that I would be better off staying where I was, so I stayed with my grandparents while mum moved out. She was a wonderful woman, and deserved to be happy. I tried not to judge her, but I couldn't help but feel like an old toy, discarded upon the discovery of a newer and better one. I never really forgave her, or tried to understand, until the day came that I had to take the decision whether to end her life or not. The heart event had left her permanently unconscious. There was virtually no chance of a recovery, when her brainstem started to show signs of damage as well. Still, it wasn't fair. I hated to be the one to make that kind of decision. Who was I to decide if someone should live or die? After consulting my grandfather, it was determined that she should be sent to heaven in peace. Twenty-five days after that, my uncle came home from work, to find my beloved aunt cold on their couch. Her estimated time of death was around eight in the morning. He didn't find her until after four o'clock. My heart broke for my poor grandfather. He is the best man I'll ever know. I couldn't imagine the weight of his heart having lost a wife and both daughters in the span of three months. There was honestly zero foul play involved in any of their deaths. They were all alone when they suffered their fatal events. They were all heart-related, but none were the same. It wasn't as if there were many pre-existing medical conditions or genetic diseases. Still, though, it was too much for my heart to bear. An entire third of my family wiped out in the blink of an eye, with no rhyme, reason, or explanation. I started looking online, I found so many posts from people experiencing the same thing. They mentioned rituals and a certain practice that I will not divulge here. The less known or mentioned of them, the better. Those years ago, when I went to lay my arrow to rest, I couldn't have realized the chain of events that I set into place that day. How could any ten-year-old kid have? My act came from a place of innocence, but it had all gone wrong. My reverence was taken as defacement. I'd pissed someone off, and now it was my time to pay. They couldn't have just killed me. No, that would have been too easy, too simple. So my family was being killed off one by one. I felt like I was trying to run from an endless chain of falling dominoes, one day I'd be too slow, and it would win. On the one hand, what do I have to live for? I have no partner, no children, and most of my family is gone. But on the other, my sense of self-preservation was surprisingly stronger than what I thought it would be. I knew I wouldn't make my grandfather go to yet another funeral. Oh, he's been through enough pain and loss, all because of that millipede because I was too young to understand, too young to know the rules. My family's half gone. Soon, most likely I will be too. I have to share this so people know, so people don't go through the same shit that I've had to. The suffering is endless, and the ripples left by a life gone too soon never really settle. So, if you happen to come across an altar in the woods... Leave it alone. If you're a rebellious sort and think I'm full of shit, well, at least heed these rules. Either light all three candles, or light none at all. Never leave an incomplete candle barrier. If the urge strikes you to say a prayer, make sure it's in conjunction with the religion the altar belongs to. You don't say a Hail Mary in a synagogue, it's for your safety, and also the life of your loved ones. Always finish the prayer. Don't leave anything incomplete. And lastly, 
but most importantly, do not in any way disturb the contents of the altar. If you're not adding to it, just leave it be. My ignorant ten-year-old self had basically violated a sacrificial altar in every way possible, and my age and innocence weren't going to absolve me from what I'd done. Well, I planned to take new candles and replace the statue back in the woods behind my old childhood home. If it works, you'll hear back from me. But if not, read this and pass the message on while there's still hope for you and yours. Automatonophobia The fear of wax figures, dummies, mannequins and other humanoid figures. I've been terrified of mannequins for the majority of my short life. I'm not exactly sure how to explain it, but, well, they just unsettle me. Maybe it was their stiff, lifeless posing, or their blank, expressionless faces. Whatever it was, I could not stand the sight of them, let alone the mere thought of them. Even as I got older, I could never go to a department store by myself. If my friends ever wanted to go to the mall, I'd practically cling to one of their sides as we passed the different stores. My friends found it hard to understand my fear, so they took many opportunities to play jokes with me. I remember the time I'd just gotten my driver's license, and they managed to shove a mannequin in the back of my car, right in the side of my rearview mirror. Well, let's just say I had to thoroughly check my back seat every time I went for a drive then. It was in the fall, and I'd just started my junior year of high school. Halloween was approaching, and we were way too old to go out trick-or-treating. So my best friend Emily decided to invite us all over to her house for a Halloween sleepover. I had nothing better to do, and it sounded fun, so I decided to go. I made my way over to her house, passing little kids in costumes on the way there. She told me that her parents were going to be away, so we could do whatever we wanted. I was the last one to arrive, and Emily invited me in with a warm smile. She led me upstairs to her bedroom, where my other three friends, Ella, Anne, and Hannah, were laughing and shoving popcorn into their mouths. Emily and I joined them, plopping on the floor and catching up with the conversation. For a while we talked about teachers we hated, people we had crushes on, and how sports was going. It was all going great until Emily brought up the subject of the old costume shop owned by Mr. Harrison. To this very day, I so very wish she hadn't. Hey, have you guys ever heard the old story about Mr. Harrison's costume shop? Emily said, crossing the room to turn off the light. She grabbed a flashlight from her dresser and sat back down. The light illuminated her face, giving her an eerie look. Hannah began to nod her head in recognition. You mean the one a few blocks from here, across from the bookstore? Hannah looked at all of us to see if we knew what Emily was talking about too. Oh yes, that's the one, Emily said a devilish grin spreading across her face. Ella, Anne, and I shared a confused look. But I thought that place closed down years ago, Anne said, shaking her head. We all looked at each other, waiting for Emily to continue. Well, it did, but that didn't stop Mr. Harrison. He'd opened that costume shop years ago, and people really loved it. He always had the best costumes and masks, People would come from all over. The reason why people loved his costumes and masks so much was because they were so real, so lifelike. Hell, even the mannequins displaying the costumes looked eerily real. A sharp chill ran up my spine, and I went stiff as Emily continued. But there was a reason why the place got closed down. Legend has it that the mannequins weren't mannequins at all. They were just innocent people. Same with the oh-so-lifelike Halloween masks. They were made from people too. And that's why we're going there, tonight! Emily exclaimed, her eyes full of excitement. Well, 
I couldn't help myself. I wanted to do anything but that. Oh, no way, I exclaimed, my voice becoming shrill. God, you know how much I hate mannequins, I said, crossing my arms. Well, that's exactly why we're going there. Unless you're a chicken, Emily said, wriggling her eyebrows. I was starting to regret coming to this sleepover. Yeah, come on, Liv. It's Halloween, Ella said excitedly. Well, I couldn't just sit there and let my friends ridicule me. Maybe this would give me a chance to finally get over my fear. I reluctantly agreed to go, and we began gathering up flashlights and other supplies. And with that, we set off into the dark. It had only taken us about ten minutes to walk to the old costume shop. We all approached it reluctantly, taking in the view of the decrepit place. It was a squat, two-story brick building with broken-in windows and vine-covered walls. I could feel the tension in the air between all of us. Emily finally broke the silence. Well, what are we waiting for? <laughs> Let's go in. She led the way pushing open the front door with slight force. A musty, putrid smell hitting my nostrils. Ugh, it smells like something died in here, I said, wrinkling my nose. Well, no, I'm not going to doubt it, Anne said, furrowing her brow. We all walked over the creaky floorboards, shining our flashlight at the barren, dusty shelves. I was starting to feel relieved. Maybe there weren't any mannequins in here after all. That was until I heard Emily's voice coming from behind a shelf. Hey guys, come look at this. I could hear the excitement in her voice, and it made me nervous. We all made our way over to her, and gawked at what stood before us. Standing on a small pedestal was a mannequin. But it wasn't like any mannequin I'd ever seen before. She was wearing a tattered blue dress and had stringy brown hair. It didn't look like a typical mannequin made out of plastic either. Her skin looked soft and she had fingernails that looked like the ones on my own hand. But her eyes, they had a lifelike glassiness. They looked helpless, pleading. I felt a knot forming in my stomach. There was something wrong here. I snapped out of my daze and realized my friends had all moved on without me. I looked at the mannequin one last time, and as I walked away I could have sworn that her eyes were following me. I continued to shine my light around, looking for my friends. I started to call out for them, but to no avail. Before long, I realized that they must be playing some sort of joke on me. I shuffled across the dusty floorboards, trying to find them. Suddenly, a hideous face popped out from behind a shelf, and I let out a shriek. All of my friends popped out, and Emily removed that disgusting mask from her face. Well, I was angry now. I hope you guys have had your fun, because I'm leaving, I said angrily, turning on my heels. Emily reached out towards me. Wait, Liv- She suddenly stopped when the floorboards began to creak and footsteps sounded from behind us. My body was frozen with sheer terror as I realized that we were all here, alone. I felt a single tear roll down my cheek as the footsteps stopped only a few feet away from us. I slowly turned around to see my worst fear actually coming true. The mannequin we'd all seen on our way in stood a mere ten feet in front of us. My friends all turned around when they saw the expression on my face. The mannequin no longer looked lifeless. It looked evil and malevolent. You know what he did, it screamed as it began charging towards us. I screamed louder than I ever had before and began to bolt towards the door. My friends followed close behind, but so did that horrible monstrosity. 
We all sprinted out of the front door and down the street. We'd made it about halfway down the street when I knew something was terribly wrong. I skidded to a halt and checked behind me. I practically felt my heart freeze in my chest. Where is Anne? I sputtered in a tear-choked voice. Just then, we all heard a deafening screech. We bolted back to the costume shop and stood frozen in our tracks. Through the doorway, we could see Anne being pulled by her ankles back into the dark abyss. I ran up to the door, but it suddenly slammed closed. I let out a wail as I tugged on the door handle, but to no avail. There was no way she was coming out, and we all knew it. We all sat in the back of the open ambulance, waiting for the police to come out of the costume shop. Despite a large wool blanket being draped over us, we all shuddered with fear. After some time, a police officer finally approached us. They'd searched the whole building, in and out. The only thing that they'd found was a mannequin that looked exactly like Anne. Well, interesting couple of stories there for you to get the week started. Um, hope you're all having a good one. Special shout out, as ever, to all those of you on the night shift, those doing long, repetitive jobs. I really hope that these stories help make the time pass a bit quicker. And of course, to all of my regular listeners as well. I don't forget any of you. Well, that's it for this evening. I have got some longer, longer stories lined up for the next uh, couple of weeks, taking a bit of time to get them put together, but I hope it'll be worth it when they finally come out. Well... Whatever I manage to get done for Wednesday, there will definitely be a video for you, so please join me again then. Until then, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook, come chat with me on Twitter, listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud, drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt, and, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so... Come check me out, okay?